Well, Greg, thank you very much for inviting me to talk this afternoon and uh, hello to everyone uh, out there who's listening. Uh, my name is Paul Bates. I'm Professor of Hydrology at the University of Bristol in the UK. And I'm also the chairman of a small startup company called Fathom, whose logo is, is blipping away in the bottom right corner of my slide. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some work we've been doing, mapping current and future flood risk down to property level across the entire US, um, which is a re reasonably uh, big undertaking. Uh, and we, in the last week, we've just made uh, an announcement of the results of these analyses, which generated a lot of press last Monday, which we'll, we'll come on to. So hopefully talk will be quite interesting and also topical as well. Um, so you might not have thought about it too much, but is, is the most costly natural disaster in the world. Um, if we just take the, the last, the 10 biggest floods between 1980 and 2014, they resulted in the loss of about 14,000 lives and, and way over $200 billion in overall losses. And you can see from the graph that the, the, the trend is, is kicking upwards as well. If we just look in the United States, uh, inflation adjusted losses since 1980 have been somewhere in the region of one trillion US dollars. Um, and we know that some of those uh, those trends are going to get worse. Um, there's a number of, you know, it, it's reasonably tricky to, to get good estimates on this, but most estimates of future flood losses say that they're going to go up in the future. There's a nice study by the Water Resource, World Resources Institute, which says that by 2030, Flooding could affect 54 million people every year and expose nearly half a trillion billion dollars in GDP. Just in the States alone, analysis we've done suggests that flood exposure is going to double by 2100, just as a result of urbanization and population growth. So that's without considering any potential for changes in climate. If we load changes in climate on top of that, of course, projecting changes in rainfall is not what climate models necessarily do best. So we know temperatures are going to rise. We, we know from the Klaus's Clapeyron relationship that um, uh, the amount of water that a warmer atmosphere will hold will rise. But um, we don't. We have less idea what's going to happen to the extremes of climate uh, distributions. But nevertheless, there's good reason to believe that that as a result of climate change, flooding will get worse in more places than it gets better. So what can we do about that? Well, the obvious thing is to tell people the areas that are at risk. And actually, we've had good techniques for doing this for very nearly 150 years. Um, we see in this slider, hopefully, a nice and not too laggy animation of a model that we built for a city in the UK. And this, uh, the color code that you see is water depth during a major flood event. And this is a five meter resolution model that resolves individual buildings across the whole city and is parameterized with some really high resolution laser, airborne laser scanning terrain data. So flood modeling, uh, these kind of uh, whole city scales, we can do relatively easily now. Um, and as I said, the basic theory of doing this is, is relatively well understood. Um, we've known about how to solve fluid dynamics equations really since George Navier and Henri Stokes. Um, and for for flooding, we solve uh, something called the shallow water equations, which is just a derivation of Navier-Stokes um, and ignores the vertical motions. So we're, flood inundation is well simulated by these dynamical methods. Um, but this, this photograph here of uh, New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina is a prompt for me to, to say that clearly, if you're going to do this at, high, at, at, uh, at city scales, you're going to need some very high resolution because of these flows around buildings and structures that become enormously complex. So all flooding is local. If you tell somebody that they're at risk of flooding and their, their house is five meters above the river, you know, you, they might be very close, but they're not at risk at all. So the detail really does matter. Um, so classical models have high computational cost. And we know for the kinds of models that we run that if we reduce the grid size, or if we halve the grid size, the computation, computational cost goes up by an order of magnitude. And because of this need for local detail, these models are also really data hungry. And those two things together have really prevented really wide area solutions to date. But at local scales um, and city scales, we can do a really good job. Now, these models are all built on conservation laws. And, and Greg told me those, 
quite a few physicists out there in the audience, so I thought I'd just go through uh, very simply how these things work. So if we take the simplest model that we can imagine, uh, built over a, a, a raster square grid of cells, you know, a structured grid, we just need two conservation laws for mass and momentum. So we have the, the change in volume, you know, mass can't disappear. If, if it moves from one cell, it has to appear in, in one of the neighbors. And then we just need to, a way of calculating the fluxes between cells. And Newton's second law tells us how to do that. And the flow between cells is really just some function of, of gravity and friction, the, the major forces, um, area, the water slope, and, and time. Um, so uh, the way we actually do it in the model is to, to rewrite the Navier-Stokes equations into a really simple form, just like this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically this is on the, the left-hand side. This is saying that the, the flux at uh, a small time delta t into the future is some function of the flux at the current time step, little q t, the gravity g, water depth, time, slope s, friction n, uh, and uh, the grid size delta x. So that's a really simple equation. And part of the, the way that you you build models over wide areas is you reduce the computational cost of doing these calculations because you're going to have to do them a lot. And you can see this, this model is, is really quite simple to turn into a, a, a central or up when finite difference procedure uh, and solve relatively cheaply. So how do these models work? What, what data do they need? Well, this is fairly straightforward as well. We, we just need to tell the model the amount of flow coming in, and that could be either river flow, as in this case here, as measured at a river gauging station. It could be rainfall, or it could be tidal water levels during a storm surge or hurricane. No matter where we get those inflow boundary conditions from, we drop those into some high resolution floodplain topography model, typically from airborne uh, laser data or digital photogrammetry. And based on that and the preceding equations, we can simulate how that water will flow over the complex terrain surface and produce a, a simulation of water depth and its changes in time and in space. We can compare those to uh, other imagery of floods. For example, this is a, a synthetic aperture radar image of a flood in Holland that we simulated. Um, and we can also compare it to other point measurements like gauging stations and water levels and so on and so forth. So in concept, these, these models are, are relatively straightforward. They're, we understand the theory. They're relatively parsimonious. They, they need relatively few data sets and parameters. Really, the only parameter that they have is friction. The boundary conditions are straightforward, and we need a DEM. And with all those things together, we can do a good job of predicting flooding. How good a job we can do, I can, I can illustrate with this example from some work I did about 15 years ago in the UK on a river called the River Severn. Um, you can see we're based in Bristol just here, and this, uh, this reach is just sufficiently uh, far north. So with this site, I have a, a LiDAR digital elevation model at three meter spatial resolution. And for some flood events which occurred in November 2000, we were really lucky that the UK Overflow, overflew the, the flood event with a military specification airborne radar. So it's a synthetic aperture radar, and it can classify the wet dry boundary of the flood to a spatial resolution of about one meter. So this is fairly uh, unprecedented data. And you can see in this image that the, the flood, the flood is, acts as a, essentially like a mirror. So it, it, the radar signal bounces away from the sensor and the flood appears dark and smooth. But where the radar sig signal interacts with dry land or buildings, the signal bounces around all over the place. There's a lot of backscatter and a noisy signal, high, high intensity signal is returned back to the sensor. And on that basis, we can segment the image into wet and dry zones really, really quite well. So question about the kinds of data you have. Uh, yeah. You, you can tell where the wet and dry spots are. Can you tell the, uh, how permeable the soil is to, you know, to water? Um, you can use synthetic aperture radar data to tell you something about the soil moisture content. It's quite tricky to do. There's been a lot of research on it over the years, and it, and it, it can be done, but with a lot of error. Um, certainly with this data, which was 
really well geared. It had the right polarization and frequencies and incidence angles to see flooding. Um, this is much better suited to picking out inundated areas. So it, it, predict, it picks out open water and dry land really quite well. So then for this kind of stuff, um, for validating all, the, you know, all these models, this is you know, invaluable. So how common is technology of, you know, one meter is obviously fantastic, but in general, how good are measurements for worldwide floods? Okay, so I mean, this, this data is pretty special, but globally we have a number of satellites in orbit which can produce um, synthetic aperture radar data down to, you know, three meter resolution if you're buying uh, and 15 meter spatial resolution if you want free to air products. Now, the instruments they put up in space are general workhorses and they're, they're, they're not specifically tuned to see floods. So the data looks a bit more noisy. It's a, it's a bit coarser resolution, but it's still pretty useful for, for validating these models. Well, it makes sense. Oh, and sorry, before we move on to other topics, uh, for underground stuff, how much does that matter and uh, how well can you measure it? Oh, what you mean underground, say sewer pipes and stuff like that? Or, well, or I was going for, you know, clay soil versus sandy versus something else. But yeah, I mean, cities is an, another nightmare. Yeah. Uh, so with this kind of modeling, well, certainly in, in this particular model, it's uh, it, the catchment's really saturated when the flood occurs. And we did some tests in, in, a, in a paper that reported these validation studies where we tried different values of soil infiltration coefficients to see if it made any real difference to the modeled inundation extent. And the answer was that over the, the really quite rapid duration of the flood, which is less than 24 hours, given the soils are already saturated, the soil moisture content didn't make a hill of beans difference to the extent of the flood predicted by the model. Um, and the impact of, of infiltration to soils is, is pretty much like that worldwide. It's only really in semi-arid areas where you get a lot of loss of floodwaters into the channel bed that you really see um, lo uh, a significant impact on the, flow of, on the flow dynamics of infiltration. So I guess the way we should be thinking about it is, by, so if, the if you have a hyd hydrological model, I mean, they, that one is going to tell you whether the soil is you know, infiltrated, whether the river is going to go above its channel, but once that happens, your model runs, and at that point in time, it's all you know covered with water, so it doesn't matter so much. Exactly so. Got yeah. Okay. So the models that that could be used to provide the input to my scheme, so the stuff that turns rainfall into river runoff, there you need to think about infiltration on the headwater slopes. By the time it gets down onto the floodplains and and down <clears throat> into the lower reaches of river basins, typically soils are saturated. And there's a vast volume of water going through in a short amount of time, and it, it just physically can't. Infiltration isn't sufficient to make any difference to the flood extent. No, it makes sense. Which is good. That that simplifies things quite a lot. Um, for things like uh, in urban areas for sewer networks, some of these models can have an integrated dynamical sewer network sitting beneath the the surface water models. But the simplest thing you can do is just make some allowance for how the drainage system is, is, has been designed. So if the drainage system has been designed to, to hold the one in 10 year rainfall, then you just remove that quantity from your, the, your rainfall input and have an effective rainfall rather than the, the total value. So there's, there's ways around for situations of, of, of uh, uh, interacting sewer networks and surface floods. So for this site, I can compare my model to these really nice observed data. And we have actually four radar images, which you can see as the dashed vertical lines in, in the right hand line graph. And if I take the, the data that was captured on round about day 313 of the year, you can see a plot of the over and under prediction here in this image. Um, so the light blue is where the model is correctly predicted inundation. Blue and uh, red and yellow are over and under prediction. And the things, uh, the dark blue is outside of the swath of the airborne radar instrument. So although we're predicting flooding there, we, we don't have observed data. So we, we can't make any statement about whether those areas are correctly predicted or not. 
The basic message of this figure is that where we have really good terrain data and a good idea of what the river flow during the event was, then we can do an absolutely superb job of predicting spatial patterns. Um, maybe you could say this is a big flood in a, in a narrow valley, so it's rather easy to predict. But I would say that actually, you know, this model's doing a pretty good job. We can also do the same thing in urban areas. So here's a, a, an air photo of a flood that happened in a, a, a city near Bristol in 2007. So you can see the, the brown muddy flood water and the difference between the green dry land. This is a, a large cathedral here, um, if you can see my cursor moving. So we produced a two meter simulation of, of uh, the inundation across this city. And we can take out the inundation extent predicted by the model at the time of the air photo overpass. And this is the, the model prediction. And it's pretty good. I mean, I would encourage you to just focus on a, a section of the shoreline and, and see how the model does. And you'll see that we're within a few pixels of the true shoreline. For example, this, this house property down here, it's very clear from the air photo that it's on a patch of dry ground. It's been, it's been sighted quite cleverly. And if we look in the model, it, it picks that up almost exactly. So where we can build these model, these high quality local models, we can do a really good job. But the challenge for a lot of risk management problems is how do we move from, from that, the thing, the animation that we can see on the left, to being able to do that over whole countries or whole continents, because there's a whole range of flood risk management decisions that you can only answer at scale. So for example, how much should the US be investing every year in flood defenses? You can only answer that question if you've got a view of what the flood risk is over the entire nation. And, and that view has got to be sufficiently locally good in order that when you scale up to the whole country, you get an unbiased result. And we know that flood inundation is quite a non-linear process. You know, uh, if, an overbank, if an embankment either is breached or not, if it overtops or not, can make the difference between lots of inundation and none. So your models have got to have sufficient local skill to capture most of that, such that when you average up to countrywide scales, your over and under predictions very quickly can't cancel out and you're left with unbiased predictions. Now, the, the, uh, the organization charged with doing that in the US is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, and lots of countries have a similar organization and, and most of them do similar things. So, what organizations like FEMA have tried to do is build out local scale flood models like this one on the left over the entire country. So they've tried to commission a patchwork of studies which cover the entire country top to bottom with models of, of this quality. And that's really quite time consuming to do and it, and it gets to be quite expensive. So this figure shows you uh, exactly where FEMA are to date with we're trying to build local models sort of the the bottom-up approach of building local models everywhere so so far fema have been doing this for almost 40 years uh, and they've managed to get about 60 percent of the country covered but if we look at the data that they've they they have um fema reckon that data should be um, uh, well, these studies should be repeated once every five years so by that reckoning uh, by FEMA's own reckoning, about 75% of their maps are out of date, you know, and some maps date back from the 90s, 80s, or even 70s. And since then, there's been huge population change and, and urbanization in many regions of the US. So this patchwork of small scale traditional flood models isn't really solving the problem. We, and even, even in areas which FEMA designate as being mapped, Actually, when you do a more comprehensive study, you realize that they've only actually mapped a small number of, or a subset of the rivers. So here's a comparison between one of our models and FEMA's modeling over, over a particular region of the US. And you can see that a lot of headwaters are, are being missed in the FEMA mapping. We also know that FEMA only, uh, only deal with river floods, and we know a lot of flood losses come from, come from inundation created by intense rainfall, what's known as pluvial flooding. In Hurricane Harvey, uh, 
about 80% of the flooded properties were outside FEMA designated flood zones to give you an idea of the scale of that as a problem. And also as well as taking a long time, it's taken a lot of money. To date, FEMA mapping's cost about 10 billion and it's going to cost about a similar amount to complete using the methods they're using. My last point about this is that often the process becomes politicized. Um, uh, communities can object or ask for revisions to FEMA flood maps, um, which may not necessarily then reflect the true risk in those areas. So what can you do? Can we do better? And we think, or we have uh, about five years ago, we thought that you can. And we've started to develop and have developed techniques to build out fluvial, pluvial and coastal flood models automatically for the whole US. So to be able to produce a, a complete whole country view uh, of locally skilled high resolution models, which can also be run for uh, climate changed conditions as well. And actually doing this is relatively straightforward. Um, we know the theory, as I said, um, the data, the models are relatively parsimonious um, and we have efficient computational solutions for doing the calculations. And we have now at least sufficient high performance computing resources in order to make a start. Um, the tricky thing is to be able to do this automatically without user operator intervention. Um, and that's where the real skill comes in. So to give you an idea, solving those equations I showed earlier is it can be done in a, a couple of hundred lines of code. I'm, I'm sure most people on the call, call could knock up a, a solver for those equations in, in a couple of hours and, and be up and running. Um, building a complete flood model that, that pulls in all the data sets, probably it's only a bit more. It's, I mean, getting the code for all the IO is probably only another few thousand lines of code. The code, however, to build models automatically over a whole continent and, and use the available data in intelligent ways to produce sensible predictions, that is more climate model class uh, software. So we, we have about 110, 120,000 lines of code that do that bit compared to a few hundred that solve the equations. Nevertheless, we can do this now. We have over the US, very good digital elevation data. So the NED DM is the national elevation data set. And we use that at 30 meter native resolution to simulate these types of flooding over the entire US. And then we can downscale to 10 or even three meter resolution quite cheaply. US Army Corps of Engineers provides a data set of where they think flood defenses are. It's probably woefully incomplete, but it's a very good start. We also have data layers, the hydrography, which tell us where the rivers are. Um, and we have river gauges, rainfall and tide gauges, which allow us to estimate the magnitude of extreme events. We well, can talk about that bit, because that's the hy hydrological model. Do you, and that's ultimately when you get a climate change, the climate change is going to affect hydrology, hydrology is going to affect hydraulics. So what's the solution there? The OK, so uh, for current conditions, uh, for historic and current conditions, we can go to uh, observations collected by USGS and NOAA which tell us rainfalls. And we can, we can regionalize those with fairly standard hydrological uh, methods. So we can, we can come up with ways of estimating the magnitude of extreme flows anywhere on the US river network and the magnitude of extreme rainfalls as well. Same thing with coastal water levels. You mean the current ones, right? The current ones, Got it. yeah. Projecting those forward for climate change is a bit tricky because then you have to take uh, climate change predictions of rainfall, sea level rise, and storm surge, and then route those through hydrology models to produce estimates of changed river flows in the future. So I'll come on to I'll come on to the climate change piece later on, but okay. it's complex to do that. Um, but building a model for current conditions is is relatively straightforward. It's just that we find a way to to take the standard bottom-up engineering approach, but do it top-down automatically using publicly available data sets. So we can represent soils and drainage systems, we can represent channel geometry, and, and importantly, we're not calibrating any of these models either. We're, we're representing friction coefficients on the basis of land use maps, uh, rather than uh, tweaking those to, to tune the models to give good results. So we, we're including all three flood drivers here. We're including, including pluvial flooding, fluvial, 
and coastal. And we're going to have a little look at, at some of those as we go along. So in terms of the fluvial model for current conditions, we generate extreme flows from the entire USGS gauge record and then regionalize that so we can, we can uh, have those at any point on the US river network. And here you see a nice, um, a nice comparison between some flood inundation data of some of the Midwest flooding that we got from Planet Labs and the, the flood depths predicted by our, our closest uh, return period simulation. You can see quite a good match here. Um, for river flooding. Same thing with, uh, with extreme rainfalls. We, we can take the magnitude of extreme precipitation from NOAA and run those for multiple different return periods and produce these really nice detailed maps of areas at risk of, of pluvial flooding over the US. And then the same thing for coastal. This is Texas. Coastal gets even more complex because there we have to think about the joint probability of tide, surge, extreme rainfall and extreme river flow. So we need ways of, of, of pulling all those together. And we also need, at least across the, the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard, to think about hurricanes. So here we've been working with Kerry Manula at MIT to use his large hurricane vent set to build the, the statistics of hurricanes into the boundary conditions. And we also, at least in, in coastal, need to take account of sea level rise. Um, even to even to produce current risks, we need to take account of sea level rise um, over the, the last 20, 30 years. And lastly, we need to take into account flood defences because clearly we intervene as humans, we intervene a lot in the flood management system. So we take the, the levees that the US Army Corps of Engineers know about and we supplement that with um, ways of automatically identifying flood controlling structures in high resolution terrain data. You see down here a paper we published recently about auto automated methods to uh, identify structures which can, can constrain and change flood patterns. We put all those together and we have a method that can largely replicate data that have cost up to $10 billion to produce. Um, and clearly, we didn't spend that much doing this. We've spent about five years. We're a team of about eight, now a team of about eight people. Um, so we're not up in the billions. Let's put it that way. Um, the question you're asking or would want to ask is, OK, so you've showed us a few choice examples, but do these models work over over wide areas? And I'm just going to show some some validation metrics here. Um, I'm going to concentrate on three hit rate, false alarm ratio, and critical success index. So the hit rate is where a benchmark data set is wet. What's the, what's our, what's the percentage of those wet cells that we correctly predict? False alarms are where we say things are wet when they're not in the benchmark. And the CSI, critical success index, blends those two things together. And it's quite a strict metric um, that accounts for both over and under prediction. And we've compared our model to, to two things. We've compared to data from, uh, it, it's easiest it turns out to compare to other models because in a real flood event, the, the return period of the event varies in space. So uh, by comparing against other models, we're, we're undertaking a more like for like comparison. The Iowa Flood Center have built very nice local models over the entire state that we can compare our model to. So this is a this image is a comparison of the the one in a hundred year layer in in our model and the those that of the Iowa flood center. Blue is the true positives, red and yellow are the false positives and negatives respectively. And you can see that we get around about ninety three percent of the benchmark uh, wet areas predicted correctly, about seven percent false alarms, and when we do this the CSI index, which you can think of as um, the blue as a proportion of the blue plus the red and the yellow, we get a, a prediction accuracy of 87%, which for this class of model it, it is fantastically high. We can do the same thing over the entire FEMA catalogue for the whole US. Now, uh, and this includes both coastal flooding and it includes fluvial flooding as well. So we exclude the pluvial and just do coastal and fluvial. And you can see on this slide a lot of examples. And again, blue is, blue is good, red and yellow are not good. Uh, and the white areas are ones where we either don't trust the FEMA quality or they're permanently wet areas. So if we think, uh, look at the performance metrics, again, 
a bit less than the Iowa Flood Center, but the FEMA models are, are not built quite to the same quality, so that's to be expected. Um, and CSI still are about as good as you can do when you compare really good local models to good satellite data. And let's have a look at the, the modeling in a bit more detail. These are fluvial flood maps for Dallas. This is the so one in five. I don't think the uh, slides are moving because we're still on Iowa. Oh, OK. Uh, I'm not. Let me see. Is that going to catch up, Greg? There may be the difference, yeah. Uh, you just keep going because I think the way you describe it captures the bulk of it. OK, yeah, cool. Um, so now I'm going to flip through a bunch of slides which we'll look at, at some results from, from Dallas. Hopefully this won't be too laggy. So this is fluvial flooding at 1.5 years. And you can see that most areas uh, of, of urban settlements shouldn't be flooded by this, this magnitude flood. Um, and as we build up to one in 20 years, the red lines are defended areas. And you can see that even 100 years, they should be holding because that's the standard they built to. But as we get to a one in 500 year events, so very rare flooding, that's going to overtop defences in, in some places, and that's what we see here in, in Dallas. Similarly, for pluvial flooding, at one in five years, the sewer network should be taking care, good care of that. Even in one in 20, it should just be valley bottoms, which people shouldn't be living in. But then as we get to one in 100 year pluvial flood events, that's quite extreme rainfall. And one in 500 as well, you can see that areas are starting in valley bottoms where, where houses are, are starting to fill up. So all this looks quite sensible. You know, the, the validation metrics look uh, plausible, uh, pleasing, uh, and the results when we look at them in, in aggregate seem, seem sensible. Coastal as well. This is Houston for a one in a hundred year coastal event in, in 2020. And as I said, climate, the, the climate model scenarios are complex. I, I'm not really going to dive too much into how we're doing this, but just to say that we're we're taking future flood scenarios for rainfall, surge, hurricane, and river flow for 2020, 2035, and 2050 under the RCP 4.5 emission scenario. And we're projecting those forward with uncertainty and using those for the future to produce a range of future flood risk for, for individual sites. And just as an example, this is the 100 year coastal flood risk in Houston in 2020 in blue, and the additional areas at risk in 2050 in red. And you can see here that as a result of sea level rise and hurricane amplification, there's large additional areas that are, that are at risk in an already risky place. Put all that together and we see a, a substantial difference to the number of properties at risk in our data set compared to the number of properties at risk when you look, do the, this analysis with FEMA's data set. And this map gives you county level information on the, the additional properties uh, or, or sometimes fewer properties at risk compared to FEMA in uh, our data. Oh, quick question. Uh, how do you know where the properties are? Ah, so we have uh, some nice databases which give um, uh, uh, property level, in, tract level information. Um, so uh, can't remember which the date name of the data provider, but there's a commercial database which gives the location of of property tracks in the U.S. and meta information about them. It's the kind of thing sense. that that it's the kind of thing that Rialto and what are those other property uh, house buying websites use? Ah, oh, so exactly. They make sense. Yeah, like so it, it's the same data set that, that underpins that. Um, so this is analysis that we did on behalf of the First Street Foundation, which is a charitable foundation in New York. Um, and these are the results that were released last week. So this is where we're, we're showing more properties of risk than, than you would expect from FEMA. We also say think that this gives you an idea of where the at-risk properties are. So the size of the circle gives the, the county level risk in 2020. And you can, you know, it's no surprise that Gulf Coast, Texas, Florida, uh, Northeast Seaboard, major population centers are where the most flood risk is, is uh, concentrated. And there's quite a lot of risk through the Appalachian chain as well, and the Ohio River Valley. And this is an idea of the change over time. So this is the change from 2020 to 2050, and the proportion of properties is substantial risk. Uh, 
you can see the impact around the coast of sea level rise and hurricane amplification on the on the Gulf Coast and the eastern seaboard, drying over the, the Great Plains region and some wetting over the Rockies and, and Pacific Northwest. Now, all this data is very nice, but clearly what we want to do is actually be able to get that to people. And that's where the collaboration with the First Street Foundation comes in. So they've taken all our data and put it on a website that you can just enter your address or zip code and you can search and see your home's flood risk. Um, so I, I think I sent the link round in, in, uh, with the abstract of the talk. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. You might be, be quite interested. I did check Google headquarters in, in Mountain View. Not, you're close to the sea, but you're not, uh, not quite in a flood risk zone according to our data, but you're not too far away either. Um, however, there's no such thing as a perfect flood model. So one reason for wanting to do this is to get people to feedback and tell us where we're wrong, because then we can look at, at what they're telling us and, and where lots of people uh, in a, a zone tell us where we're wrong, we can go in and find out why and hopefully modify things and improve over time. And just to give you an example, I, I did the risk analysis for the, uh, the First Street Foundation headquarters in Brooklyn. Uh, given they were located in Water Street, it, it didn't take a genius to work out that they were potentially at flood risk, and, and that's certainly the case. Um, so they're quite close to the East River. Flood risk for these properties are increasing. And on the platform, we can also look at what happened during historic flood events. For example, this is their, their headquarters during Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy. And then we can look at risk in the future. So what's the, uh, we can change the, uh, the, the projected flood risk, and we can look at, at the range of depths here. All this came out last week, and some of you may have seen that it gained quite a lot of press in the, the major US papers um, and, and news outlets. Um, so it's clearly important. And the idea is that hopefully this data will get people thinking more about their flood risk and more about the economic impacts of climate change. What next? Well, clearly, this is not a solved problem. I think we've demonstrated good progress and we're, we're moving rapidly. But ideally, we'd want to move to higher resolution, native resolution models, particularly for urban areas where 30 meter resolution doesn't allow us to resolve buildings. But if we get down to building resolving scales of one or two meters, the compute cost is massive. So if we halve the model resolution, we double the, we, we go up an order of magnitude in compute cost. So going from 30 meter to 15 to seven and a half to 3.25, a 3.25 meter model is gonna cost a thousand times more. Currently running these models over the US takes about two months on 200 cores. So, Wait, so let me understand the cost. So if you're doing, I'm trying to figure out. So I mean, two months over 200 cores is actually not that much. I'm trying to figure out how, you know, are you running the entire US at a time or is it one, you know, square? Like how big of an area is one single run? That, that, yeah, you know, so pro? We, break, we break up into 10 degree by 10 degree tiles. And then we, we further break up to river catchments within those. So we do that automatically. Um, but a, a run of all the tiles over the whole U.S. takes about two months for, for a couple of thousand cores. Well, if you get every river catchment, we're talking about, what, a few thousand for the U.S.? Uh, it depends how, where, where you cut the boundaries. You, you can make them as big or small as you like. So uh, at one level, there's, there's only about 10. So the, the Arkansas, the Mississippi, the Missouri. Uh, but if you go down to tiny little headwaters, there's hundreds of thousands. Um, basically, it's about two months on 2,000 cores for the whole US. But if we were to halve the grid resolution and go to 15 meters, then that would be 20 months on 2,000 cores. And clearly, you can play about with those numbers. Uh, uh, if we added an order of magnitude more cores or two orders of magnitude more cores, then we could shrink some of those. Okay, that makes so, sense. It doesn't sound like something, like with enough money on a cloud computer, then it should be, yeah, maybe something to discuss later because this is not, it's not require a real supercomputer. I mean, I come from DOE where they have giant supercomputers. This is like a cloud computer, you know, with a few million dollars, but it may be very cost effective yeah. for uh, insurance companies. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be the case. And, and you could be smart and only do the high resolution over where you've got 
where people are, so only in urban areas. And it would be simple to define where those sites are. So we could we could do 30 meter in rural catchments and three meter resolution over urban areas. But that that's solvable. Right. Less easy to solve is is the second point here, which is identifying including local structures. So uh, if we're putting data out of the public, you know, if your house is wrong, you're going to hate the whole data set. Um, uh, so we need to make sure that our models have sufficient local skill that they're right much, much more than they're wrong. Um, at the moment, we're, we're probably wrong in a non-trivial number of places and we want to we need to drive that down. That, exactly how you do that is not straightforward or, or even obvious. Um, some places we need better terrain data. That, that's easy to solve, but the US is a big place. Um, airborne laser data would be would be nice. In a place like the UK, we've got the whole country done. Um, uh, but we're a pretty small place compared to uh, a continent-sized country. And as I said, the, the climate change impacts are, are, are not easy to do. It's complex to do this. So I think more effort on that. Um, and probably think as well about future population and GDP projections, because they, they might be just as uncertain as, as climate uh, as well, and just as significant. And with that, I think I'm a couple of minutes over, but that's the, that's the end of the presentation. So thanks very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, well thank you very much. Um, well, let me ask you, uh, I don't know if, does anybody else on the call have a question before I ask? Okay, well, I'm going to ask the obvious one, I think, which is, it, it seems they have a very good model for, uh, you know, the hydrology, I'm sorry, hydraulics. And where I'm trying to figure out, you know, like, how you make it fully really accurate is the climate to hydrology, you know, feeding your model. So let me ask the first yeah. one. So there's a ton of climate models. I mean, I understand how they work. Presumably, you need a downscale from the climate resolution to the resolution you can use. How do you accomplish that? Yeah, so the first thing we do is uh, for the historic and current simulations, we can largely use the observed river flow and rainfall data that we get. For the future, we take a, a bias corrected and downscaled set of CMIP5 climate models. Um, so bias corrected to, to get the, the rainfall extremes uh, a bit more accurate. We then run those um, bias correcting downscale rainfalls through models which simulate catchment rainfall runoff. So we use a, a Swedish model called HBV. Uh, I won't try and pronounce it in Swedish, it, it, I'll mangle the words. Um, and we use that to run the, the, the climate time series. We calibrate those models for current day conditions and then we run climate change, um, uh, climate model precipitations through those hydrology models and uh, look at the percentage change in river runoff. We then regionalize those percentage changes of river runoff to all catchments in the US based on catchment characteristics and climate zone types. So it's a bit complex and it, it, there's no perfect way of doing that, but that's what we've hit on as an expedient and, and relatively uh, parsimonious way of doing that, that, that doesn't introduce too many additional uncertainties. For coastal zones, we need to do something different. So we have to take the uh, sea level rise plus future storm surge and hurricane climates and route those through offshore wave models and also do something about the wave setup as well. So we have offshore tide surge models, wave models to predict um, uh, the future extreme water level climate at the coast that we can then sample stochastically from and generate ensembles of synthetic events that we run through the model that, that we can then take statistics from the, those model ensembles. Again, it, it's quite a complex process, which is why I, I suggest at the end it's something that needs more thought and more work as we go forward. We have a we have a working solution, but I'm not sure we're at the end of the line where it comes to knowing exactly how to do this. So kind of building on that question, there's a lot of models, like I'm thinking hydrology's national water model for the US, or yeah. there's private vendors like CoreLogic that have, I mean, they have implementations of many of these disaster models themselves. 
does it make sense to couple what you've done with what they've done? Yeah, you, you can certainly do that. Um, we've kept everything in house because we like to be in control of the process. Um, we want to know how those uh, hydrology models have been set up and calibrated. Uh, and we want the experimental control from that. Um, the national water model is uh, has its own issues in predicting extreme flows. It was set up for forecasting rather than uh, predicting uh, uh, predicting hazard maps. So it's got some slightly different characteristics. But in principle, we can hook up the, the hydraulic model that we've developed to any boundary forcing. So we can we can force it with any land surface or rainfall runoff model or climate model output. 